Tim from Carol Hood, Under Oath, producer, manager. Dude, you wear a lot of hats, so what's been going on in your world? Carol Hood's EP just came out a couple weeks ago, Under Oath's on some festivals, and you seem like a busy guy, so uh, just filling on what life's been like for you lately. Man, everything. Um, I am... Oh, brother. Uh, <laughs> lots of stuff, man. We got a relatively busy year with Under Oath. Uh, I just stopped managing a hip hop artist that I managed for the last two years named Andy Minio because my life got crazy. Uh, Carol Hood just finished our third installment, um, called self titled that's out now, which is prompting us to talk. And, uh, and then myself and my brother in law, Nate, um, who's also one of the members in Carol Hood own a coffee company called King Space in Tampa. And we just bought a building. And I spent all day in my lawyer's office and city office trying to get permits to build out our new cafe and bar. So to say I'm busy is probably an understatement, <laughs> but uh, that's how my brain works uh, the best, honestly. I think I'm one click short of having to sleep with TVs and feedback and static on just to stay sane. So yeah, dude, uh, it's, uh, it works wanted to talk to you about is that you do have this other switch you're also a family guy and so where does that switch come on to where you know it's time to be a family man versus businessman because you got all these things going on and so what is it like in your mind when do you switch those modes and how do you process that yeah it's a great question um i think you really just have to make a priority you know and it's like i i don't i don't necessarily tell my family this but because it almost sounds degrading, but like in a business world and in a busy, like mental headspace, we look at everything as appointments, right? And it's like if my lawyer for Team State says, I need to see you at 1 p.m., I better damn not be late, yeah. you know? And if Under Oath has a show tonight at 8, I can't show up at 8.45 because then we're going to get canceled on and not get paid. And we're going to have a bunch of pissed off fans that drove and paid money to see us. So at the same time, I look at like my commitment to my family in the same way. It's like, yo, dinner is at six and you know, you're not allowed to be late. Just like you're not allowed to be late to any other major obligation in your life. And the people that, you know, consistently are late with their families because they had better things to do or more quote unquote important things to do. Uh, in one of them up until recently, uh, are just have a little bit of a, a priority and time management switch in their brains that has to be unlocked, you know? Yeah. Um, and it's not easy, and I'm not perfect, but I think that's, that's, the, that's the goal, right? You know, yeah. and for instance, like this week, my wife is going to uh, Houston to visit her sister and brother, well, brother and sister-in-law, and she leaves Thursday morning, so I have all three of my kids Thursday and Friday. And tonight, our family's going to the beach to have an early dinner and watch the sunset oh, nice. and i told them i can't go because it's like i'm already trying to cram five days worth of work into three days so i can't cut one of those days short if anything i need to be working longer um to make up for it my wife obviously understood she's like yeah that makes sense we'll be gone till eight o'clock so you can stay in the office late get all the stuff you need to get done done so that when you have the kids it's you and the kids time and there's nothing else in the middle of it yeah. You know, me and my son already have plans for Thursday and Friday and Saturday uh, with the girls. And we got everyone has their little things we're doing with dad. And, and I'm not going to be working through that time because I'm doing it all now. So when they have me, they have me as much as I can. And, uh, you know, being a business owner and working in this weird world, there's always that 5.30 p.m. call that derails you. But at the same time, you know, it's... Uh, it's really just one of those things you got to constantly fight the balance, but, you know, your priorities show through with how many times you miss that date, you know? Yeah. Something that uh, this led into that I wanted to touch on, too, is the timing that the CP was released, because Under Earth initially broke up a couple of years ago, Amberlin broke up the year after, and I'm sure saying thing is still going strong and all that, but Under Earth is back and going on all cylinders, but you guys released this EP at the beginning of January, and so... Uh, I guess the question is, you know, with the timing, why now versus, I guess, when you were maybe less busy with, you know, Under Oath and Nate doing Amberlin and that kind of thing? Yeah, it's a really good question. Um, I had a full-time job during Under Oath um, for the two years before we broke up and then during the hiatus. So I was working 50, 60 hours a week, uh, started uh, development and branding and um, 
design agency in the merchandise space and was really, you know, on planes to LA, New York, Atlanta all the time when I was home for those three years. I quit that job last year, right about the time when Under Oath started. Uh, I quit my job like a month after Rebirth Tour. Um, so I really ended up having a lot of free time in between Under Oath stuff for the first time in my life ever. This time. And so King State was moving and I really just came to the spot where I'm like, if I'm going to do something with King State and Carol Hood, which are my two real passions, I got to kind of take a risk, cut out this easy job that is, you know, a stable income and has a big infrastructure and just take a risk. So that's what I did. I'm writing. I'm spending more time in the studio than I ever have for, you know, Carol Hood and recording my friends, bands, limbs and all that. So it's like, it's just been really cool, man. And uh, just being able to, have two o'clock lawyer meetings and city council meetings for King State would have never happened had I been working full time somewhere else. So yeah. at the end of the day, man, it's, uh, it's all good. Before we touch on your production side and stuff, something else that I've heard you say on Matt Carter's Break It Down podcast is that you are more of a plug and play kind of guy, sort of straight up, you know, hard hitting guitarist. And so one thing I noticed with the Carol Hood EP is that there's sort of this ambience and all these pretty noises, maybe some effects, delays, and that type of thing. And so was it a difficult transition, or was it a little challenge for going from that hard-playing, plug-and-play kind of guy into something more pretty and ambient? No, and honestly, in the same token, you know, a lot of my guitar tones were just straight up. And what I meant to say by that on the Break It Down podcast, like a lot of these dudes obsess over tone and hand-wired pickups and you know, you won't believe what I did. I changed out my two band for these six L sixes instead of EL thirty fours and now the bottom end is so rich and it's like I don't really care about any of that stuff. As long as it's loud and it sounds cool, I'm good. And that's the same way I am with Carolhood, man. It's like, you know, I i I'll use a plug in, I'll use a you know, an orange amp, I'll use a matchbox amp, whatever I can do to get the sound. I don't really think about the art of tone that much and I leave that up to the mixer and I, feel, I found that if you get out of the you know trying to pre-mix your album with golden tones and trust the person that's gonna you know scoop the mids that you should have caught if you were paying attention if you were a tone guru or whatever um, <clears throat> all I focus on is the vibe so it's just give me some distortion if I want delay I use you know in the studio, I really love Sound Toys, which is a plug-in suite. Um, and they have this plug-in called Echo Boy. And dude, between Echo Boy and Alter Boy and all these different plugins they have, man, like I just get what most dudes have to bring in $2,500 worth of hand-wired pedals. And man, I just get there so quick and it keeps creativity going. And I think a lot of the nuances and they're like, wow, that's really deep. Um, that you pick up on in Carol Hood's really the performance and really like the creativity because we're not sitting around for two hours trying to move a microphone around to get the perfect tone. Yeah. It's all about the moment when it hits, we just run and it's like, doesn't matter. Just go. We'll mess with it later. And so at the end of the day, like I feel like it's still just as raw as under oath. There's just more dynamics because the music lends itself, you know? Something that that just led into that just popped in my head was that have you ever considered or thought about doing, I guess, a Tim McTagg type of guitar software where you have your plugins or your rig digitized, you know, sort of like how Joey Sturgis has his tones or maybe Jason Richardson with his stuff. Have you ever thought about putting one out there for, you know, yourself, for people to download and play with that a ton of these well-known producers and other guitar players have done over the years? Um, or what, what, not whatever Not really. I mean, I think I'd be more interested in sharing that for free um, because I think I think that people like Joey Sturgis and Chris Lord Algae and even Aaron, uh, our drummer in Under Oath, you know, he released a drum replacement sample pack. And those guys spend real time. Like, those are the nerds. Those are the guys that sit and they bring in the Black Beauty snare and then they put 18 microphones on it and they merge them all and some of them mix them, run them thousand dollar compressors and like you know when you pay 40 50 bucks for that stuff you're really paying for a value you know and for me i think you know on one hand it's really easy to be like man me saying tim from under oath tones you know you can get everything from chasing safety to 
you know, lost in the sound of separation or disambiguation and everything in between for, you know, one easy price of seventy nine ninety nine. I think a lot of people will buy that because they respect what we've done. But really what I'd be doing is just using our name, my name, to sell people tones that Adam D., Matt Goldman, Chris Lord Algae, and the people that mix those records and help get those tones got. And then I just try to replicate them as close as possible to put my name on it to do a quick cash down. And I'm just really anti-business in that way. I think if you ever ask anyone for money, you better be bringing more value than it's worth. And I think that's why, you know, Under Oath's been really successful. And that's why Carol Hood does pretty well, because we don't ask a lot of people for a lot of things. Yeah. And when we do, we make it an event and we try to make it more valuable and go, man, I would have paid double for that. It doesn't, you know, and that's our goal. Whether we achieve that or not um, is up to the consumer. But for me, like, I don't really, if I spent the last 15 years learning how to wire, you know, pickups and guitars, I'd for sure sell a pickup 200 bucks and be like, this is what you hear every night on tour. But I'm just not that dude. Yeah. You know, I don't, I wouldn't even be able to tell you why I sound the way I sound. <laughs> so, I mean, yeah, sure, I could probably make a thousand bucks or ten thousand or fifty thousand or whatever it is uh, to scale, but at the end of the day, it's not really worth it. You know, yeah. I'd rather focus on creating dope stuff and you know enjoy having fun with my friends and drink beers and create. And if a song gets on the radio or a song gets on Super Bowl commercial or a song gets two hundred plays on Spotify, I could care less. You know. Yeah, something I touched on with Corey Brandon last year when Hundred Sons was putting out their record was sort of like starting over in a way with a new band that has members from other bands that have gone and played a th uh, thousand cap room, sold out shows and stuff. And so from your experience, is it sort of humbling in that sort of way that you're sort of starting over despite you, Nate, and Reed and all the, uh, you know, everybody in the band coming from much more popular bands in that regard? I, I think it would be if I expected it to be like under those but i think you know what's really funny is a lot of people don't realize until they try it that seeing the guy in the band you know you always see the lead singer the drummer the main guitar player thinks that like i'm the reason why this band's successful so whatever i do people are going to follow it's not really the case man people don't come to under those shows to watch me play they come to first under those shows to watch me play with five of other my other friends you know and i think carol Hood by default, has to be its own thing. And we've sold more tickets than we've ever thought we would have. We never even thought we'd play a show. We played our first show four years after we released our first song. It was just supposed to be a fun project to just put up and like exercise creativity without any expectations. And that's still what it is, you know? Yeah. Um, so, I mean, we, have, we don't have any goals. We don't want to sell out a thousand cap room. We don't want to sell 10,000 albums or 100,000 albums or a million records. Like, we just... None of that is what we want to be or do. So for us, there's no humbling about it. If anything, it's more fun to just be at a bar with, you know, two, three hundred people, and they're all our friends, and they're just there to celebrate us, and half the people there don't even care about our band specifically. It's just a reason to go out and drink and chill with all their friends. And yeah. I like that. And I think that's where Carol Hood will sit. And I think if you tried to make it, you know, you want to be the next Arcade Fire, the next Phantogram, then you feel with, like, pressure and bands and fighting and all that stuff. And at the end of the day, like, I've learned a lot from Under Oath, and I, I want to stay in that space with that band and not add more to it, you know? Okay. It's almost yeah. like being married, you know? Yeah. Like, being married is the best thing I've ever done, but at the same time, I don't want to go out and get married to three other people and try to have three successful marriages because it's like, it takes so much work and effort and man, look what we built, me and my wife. But it, it definitely puts perspective on trying to do it again just because you want to, you yeah. know, it's like, it, it's a lot, it's a lot deeper and more uh, meta than that, I think. And for me, I've, I, I've never wanted Under Oath success, even for Under Oath, I'm glad it's here and I'll embrace it until it leaves, but I don't even feel an obligation to keep that success, so why would I chase it with something else that's supposed to be just a different thing? Yeah, I got you. I guess the, I guess the last thing I wanted to get into really was your, your production work with, with Limbs. I found them online last year, listened to it, really liked the sound, and 
you know, I thought it was cool that, you know, you were, you're producing that for them and stuff. And they really do have that chaotic sound that has that catchy out element too, which, which is something I really love. It's one of the reasons, you know, I love, you know, bands like Under Oath, Norma Jean, that kind of thing, that whole like aggressive sound with that catchiness to it. And so, um, how did you yep. come about finding that band? And I guess, what was it like working with that band? Because I'm sure, I'm sure they definitely looked up to you in that way. But at the same time, I'm sure you've looked up to other people you've worked with before too so what was it being on that side where, where they were I guess sort of looking for you looking up to you for you know advice and um, all that kind of stuff yeah it's a good question um, it's not as like uh, it's not as extravagant nor um, you know uh, cool of a story as you might like but I mean pretty simple the drummer of that band is my wife's little brother so my little brother-in-law started playing drums when me and my wife first got married like 10 okay. years ago I think he was like 13 and he got his first drum set and me and Nate would just encourage him like yeah man keep going you're doing great and Nate would show him some stuff and help him out and then just kind of got older and joined a band and the dude the singer of Lynn's has been a friend of ours for a while and he you know works at a coffee shop that King State works with in town so we've known each other and they just needed somewhere local to play music and you know record records so i started helping them out and then uh we ended up um working on the most recent album for equal vision once they got signed and you know they're just a really cool band and they do really work and people gravitate towards them once they hear them and so you know i don't think that i've developed them or broke them or help even getting them the success they've had they've worked really hard and i'm just happy to be a part of it and you know yeah i help chris sculpt songs we work through production elements and ideas together we really just you know work well together because chris is a visionary and has an idea and basically vulnerably comes to me with a bunch of songs and says well what is this like is this good is it not what do you think how can we make it better and i just give them comments you know definitely not anything more than just us collaboratively working um, and me helping them get the best out of what they already are instead of changing them or adding to them. You know? Is that something you're looking to do in the future maybe? Like help more bands that you may see in your local area who are killing it or that you might think need some guidance or some extra help and maybe manage them or develop them? Is that something that you could see yourself doing, you know, on top of all the other stuff that you're doing as well? No. I think the turn of the year, um, you know, I had a pretty clear vision of what my future looks like, and it's really simple, and it's just focus on Team Tate and Under Oak and Feral Hood, and then help everyone else out where I can. As far as having ambitions or wanting to find new talent or build something up, you know, I flirted with starting a label and starting... At the end of the day, my real passion is just creating, being not in control, but just at least in the band, so to speak, and with King Fate, I own half of it, and with Under Oath, I'm a, you know, I'm an actual member in the Carol Hood, it's our thing, and I, I work the best when it's my neck on the line, and there's no one to blame, and there's no one to, uh, you know, look past, and it's just all on you, and I perform well in those scenarios, so that's kind of where I want to continue to position myself. Don't want to take too much more of your time. I know Under Earth has some festivals coming up. Obviously, Carol Hood just dropped an EP a couple weeks ago. Everybody should go check out. Is there anything else you want to plug or promote real quick before we uh, let you go here? Oh, that's it, man. Yeah, Under Earth's going to be touring a bit this year. Pretty low-key uh, festivals and things like that. And, and um, Carol Hood's going. And then check out uh, TeamStateCoffee.com and uh, swing by in the summer when we open and grab a cup of coffee or a beer and say, hey, what's up? All right, man. Well, uh, thanks for doing this today, and uh, thanks for talking to us. It was awesome. Yeah, for sure. For sure. I do. Thanks for uh, reaching out. I appreciate it.